<laughs> Again, I'm, I'm Jeff George um, with IMG Rebel. Uh, from an education background, uh, environmental design, urban and regional planning. Um, I started my career out of grad school in the uh, public sector, uh, actually looking at energy from waste as a means of uh, waste disposal. This was back in the 80s, uh, up in the Northeast. Uh, but then moved into the private sector and have spent the last 25 years in the private sector, uh, again, in the, in the waste and recycling uh, side of things. Um, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Lenny. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. My name is uh, Lenny van Klink. Uh, that's a very Dutch name, which I am. Uh, I'm based in Rotterdam and I'm teaming up with my uh, US colleagues. So I'm on average one week every month here in the US. And that's um, uh, due to the fact that I try to head up our international waste and recycling team. Uh, and we have some experience with a new approach which, which we call Recycle by Design. And I would like to thank Chris for the opportunity we have here uh, to tell you a little bit about the uh, Recycle by Design. And I really would like to be it uh, interactive. Uh, so if you have any question, please interrupt me because then we have a conversation and otherwise I just have the feeling that I uh, cause a tsunami of words uh, to you, which is uh, causing more devastation than it will ender. Uh, well then in the spirit of that, I just want to make sure <coughs> Is there anyone on the phone? There's supposed to be a number of people. If you could really quickly say who you are so we know you're on the phone. Go ahead. This is Mary Lynn Will here, District Department of the Environment. Thank you. Anyone else? This is the Riley Department of General Services, DC Government. Excellent. And Christine, are you on? Are you hiding? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, first I want to give you some comfort uh, because I encountered that the name Rebel um, has a particular flavor in the U.S., but, but you can sit back and relax because we, we're nice guys. Um, and basically Rebel is a financial uh, consultancy firm and we operate in a specific niche and our niche is public-private partnerships. Um, um, so we only work in sectors and we only work uh, on projects where we try to bring uh, the public and the private interests together in a workable um, uh, uh, project. And actually we try to, to bridge the gap between infrastructure needs and financial resources. Um, we have offices around the world um, uh, Rebel is, is uh, a Dutch company in Rotterdam, it's our office, but we also have an office in Antwerp, uh, in Belgium, in Manila, in the Philippines, in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. And um, uh, two years ago, we teamed up with uh, IMG, uh, with a big track record here in the US. And Steve Steckler is uh, the head of IMG. And perhaps, Steve, you can say, uh, do the one minute pitch, uh, which is, of course, not enough time, but tell something about sure. IMG. Um, uh, IMG was founded 20 years ago. And um, since its inception, it's, it's always believed in partnerships in the public interest. And uh, we have uh, managed many of the largest <coughs> public private partnership uh, transactions in the United States. Uh, the largest transportation uh, public-private partnership, the largest water public-private partnership, um, the largest nuclear waste public-private partnership. Somebody's got to clean the stuff up. Uh, and um, uh, the largest uh, aviation airport public-private partnership. So although we are a modest-sized firm, our specialty is very much bringing the public and private sectors together in, in projects and activities to which government has traditionally been the only player. And uh, by, you, by bringing the public and private sector together, we get the best of, we believe that we get the best of both worlds in, in addressing um, community problems. Uh, that extends to, um, that extends to uh, recycling uh, and waste management. And, uh, and in fact, we have a capital investment arm, which also looks to provide um, uh, investment funds for uh, these types of projects. So uh, we're delighted to be here with you to all to talk about 
um, the opportunities for uh, the the unified Dutch American approach yep. to uh, to bring the most uh, innovative uh, processes and financial methods to solving these types of issues. Okay, so um, thanks. Are there questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Do, does this include um, incineration, thermal recovery of energy? Yeah, we have <coughs> we have clients, uh, and uh, in our own country, in the Netherlands, uh, waste to energy <coughs> is a uh, more general practice than it's here yeah. in the U.S. Are, are you pitching that here in D.C.? Um, uh, no, we are bringing uh, not particular, uh, but uh, for us, it is one of the methods, and there are other okay. methods. For this city, there it's not. Yeah. Right. It's very much a local policy call. We yeah. understand. We understand that for some <coughs> communities, that's a solution that works well for them, yeah. uh, and for other communities, that's just yeah. not part of the. I just strategy. want to save time, but not yeah, yeah. to discuss it. No, yeah. I mean the pur the purposes of this is to have an open discussion and open forum in I terms of what ideas. To, I don't want to discuss it. Yep. 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 No. Yeah. Okay. Just so you know, when I met with them originally, I, I made it clear that 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 for example, that the incineration isn't going to happen in D.C. For example, at least not. Uh, all the forms that are that are available to DC at this moment, and um, so, but it's the process. I want to focus on this process that could help drive all, a lot of other types of of, of uh, waste management projects. Yeah. So, so let's uh, allow us for a few seconds, uh, uh, for a few minutes, to explain the ideas we have, because uh, if we look at this area, there's a challenge, uh, and uh, there. Uh, in my opinion, the challenge is huge. Uh, so, if you really have the ambition to become a zero waste city, or to reach a situation <coughs> in which you have a uh, waste diversion goal of 80%, uh, that is uh, a disruptive a, a disruptive change is necessary. So, you need to do something really different. <laughs> and the, the the big question is what will lead you to that end result. So uh, what kind of process do you need to follow uh, in order to reach that high ambition, which uh, we think uh, is the right way to move. Uh, so the ambition, we align completely with the ambition. Uh, but, but the question is how to get there. Um, and we think that you need innovation to really reach that uh, goal. And uh, we're here to talk about the process which we have called Recycle by Design. Um, and basically, the, the general idea of Recycle by Design is <coughs> that, you, that, you, that it's best to look at the opportunities of, of the challenges, not so much as a problem, but um, uh, um, uh, recognize the value that's in the, that's in, uh, the materials and the opportunities you have to create jobs, uh, to develop new markets, and uh, to grow thriving businesses. And like I said in the introduction, we believe that a P3 framework, so a public-private partnership framework, can boost that innovation. Um, uh, and if you want to have that disruptive change, you really need to assemble the most talented um, uh, research, researchers, uh, designers, engineers, business entrepreneurs, and policy makers, and most important, you need to team up with the local um, uh, communities, because this is also about changing behavior of people. Uh, and uh, the best thing to do, the best way to achieve that is uh, by uh, aligning with uh, the local communities. Now, um, Recycle by design isn't a fantasy. It is a real process, and it will lead to real results. And I can make that statement because we have experience with it, uh, and there are striking similarities with um, uh, the process called rebuild by design. Uh, and we don't want to brag about it, uh, but it is a little bit Dutch-inspired. <laughs> Let me say it in that way. Um, and uh, IMG Rebel has been very closely involved with the re uh, Rebuild by Design because that's the approach that has been followed uh, after Superstorm Sandy hit the New York metro area. 
And there, of course, was a big sense of urgency uh, to rebuild the infrastructure. And the question is how to do that? How to do that in such a way that you rebuild um, uh, uh, the local uh, infrastructure um, in a way that it is resilient, that it is even better to uh, uh, withstand the next superstorm. You, ju you, you just do not want to rebuild everything that has been um, um, uh, devastated, but you need to build it in a better way. So there is something we call a jump. You need to do it, you need to do it better. Um, and Marcel is one of our team members uh, who has actually uh, worked in one of the winning uh, examples of Rebuild by Design. And um, we just want to explain a little bit and we will send you uh, the presentation. Chris already has the, this presentation and we will distribute it because uh, of course you cannot read it. Uh, but afterwards if you have the presentation we, uh, we will. Marcel, could you in... in three or four minutes max, explain something about uh, Rebuild by Design. Yeah, okay. The, the great thing about this slide, by the way, is that you, we, we can easily talk for two hours about this, uh, this slide alone, but, um, but I will, I will uh, keep it um, short. Um, so we've been involved in, uh, as one of the um, bidding teams in this competition, and we've also been involved in shaping this uh, this competition uh, on the from the other side of the table. We've, by the way, also been involved in structuring similar competitions in other uh, contexts. And uh, so the, the starting point is a great sense of urgency after Superstorm Sandy and the acknowledgement that that um, the uh, the challenges cannot be solved in old school ways with uh, uh, single purpose engineering solutions because there's not sufficient funding. Uh, because uh, rebuilding requires more integrated solutions, um, uh, not, not single-purpose uh, in investments. Um, and, and in short, um, the, uh, the analysis is, in order to successfully build those cities in a more resilient way, we need innovation. Um, and in order to achieve innovation, uh, it, is, it is helpful to use an innovative process, uh, which is what Rebuild by Design is. So what makes Rebuild by Design so innovative? Um, uh, um, I think it's, it's mostly innovative because of um, one thing is it's about early involvement of uh, the industry. So uh, if you look at uh, P3s, in, in a lot of cases, a typical P3, first uh, in a typical P3, the, um, most likely the government or an agency first defines a um, solution. Uh, which is then tendered out in a, in a P3 procurement. And yes, there is some room for, for uh, innovation, but it's fairly limited. In this process, um, uh, we took one step back or um, get to, uh, uh, earlier in the, in the value chain, you could say. So even before defining solutions, maybe even before defining the actual problem and challenges, the process was started and, and there was involvement of the industry. Um, so it started, there's four phases. The f first phase is uh, compete, and compete is about competition. Um, over a hundred uh, consortiums of companies competed to participate in this, uh, in this process. Um, uh, and then it was, there, was, there was a short list of 10 selected uh, bidders that were allowed in this, this, uh, this process. So that's all about uh, competition and selecting the, the consortiums that are not only uh, able to come up with great ideas, uh, and they showed it in their, their, their pre-qualification documents, but also would be able to implement them, to, to, um, uh, to actually um, uh, not only have bright ideas, but to, to, uh, to be able to make it happen. That's the, f that's the first phase. The second phase is, um, was research, and that is because it was not always exactly clear what the problem is, or we didn't know everything about uh, why exactly certain areas had been, so we've been focusing on southern Nassau County. Uh, there was a lot of flooding in southern Nassau County, but uh, we found out uh, <coughs> through research that a lot of the flooding was not from the seaside, but from the land side, stormwater. And so uh, this is just an example to say you need more research. Sometimes you need more research to first find out what the actual problem is before you jump into solutions. Um, so that was the second phase. In that second phase, we already immediately reached out to uh, residents, businesses, 
local communities, uh, stakeholder groups, because, uh, and there was another unique um, uh, element in this whole approach, is that it was um, uh, truly a collaboration of all the stakeholders involved. We've had over 100 meetings with, uh, with all the, the stakeholders involved, and, and that actually led to a, a better proposal uh, in the end, and also better understanding of the, of the problem. <coughs> but not only that, it also led to a movement, a, um, a change in, the, in, in our case in southern Nassau County, that was unstoppable. So even after um, the, the RBD process was stopped, you can still, we changed something and there is a movement that is still ongoing and that makes people constantly think about uh, uh, all the investments, all the, uh, everything they are doing, uh, looking from the, the lens of uh, rebuild or building a more resilient um, uh, area. Um, so it, then the, the, the third phase was the design phase uh, in which we developed um, uh, solutions and a very specific plan. Um, and our plan was one of the winning plans, meaning that the, the, the plan was selected for implementation and there is federal funding available, uh, funding from uh, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, uh, to, uh, to actually invest in those uh, projects. Um, the grantee in our case is New York, New York State, and so New York State currently is, so currently we're in the, in the fourth phase, which is the implementation uh, phase, and so New York State um, is developing an implementation plan and we are involved to help them implementing this, uh, this project. Uh, so again, I think, so what it <coughs> led to is, is six great plans um, that really are integrated solutions also, and, and also um, plans that could have never been developed by one single agency, for example. Um, uh, and in addition to that, um, a change in the way uh, communities and agencies are looking uh, um, um, to this this area and and are uh, doing business uh, nowadays. So that's in short uh, what the, okay. the concept is. And like you said, I think if you had two hours ah, yeah, about yeah, uh, because this is really a very huge project. Uh, but but let's shift because <coughs> we are now here for the challenges uh, in this area and we're searching for a way to really reach the zero waste city. Um, Let me kind of interject one, one last thing. Which yeah, of I, course. I want to make sure that, that people, and people focus on, on this. What distinguished, among several things, the rebuild by design in, uh, for, uh, New Jer for New York, New Jersey, um, and the coastal, vulnerable coastal areas, was the degree to which the community and design professionals were and planners were uh, brought together in a very highly integrated process. This was very much a community-driven culture. This was a culture-driven process. We wanted to change the culture, the way people thought about their infrastructure and their understanding of how the infrastructure interfaced with their environment, their living environment. <coughs> and that's the cultural process is what we're trying to bring to recycling here. Yeah. Um, and that uh, is because we believe that you only can make a disruptive change to 80% recycling or a, a zero waste city if you have the involvement of uh, the majority of the, the people and the businesses involved. Uh, and, the, and the basic question is how do you reach them? How do you really get those um, uh, citizens, uh, local communities uh, involved? Uh, and we believe that uh, the element of a competition brings out the best of people. Um, so yes, you have the ambition here uh, to reach the zero waste uh, city. Um, uh, and that is a complex challenge. Um, and if you organize a competition for the best ideas, not just one idea, but the best ideas, uh, you can reach two very important goals. And I would like to uh, express them um, explicitly um, because that is the, the basis of this whole uh, process, that through a competition, 
you are able to promote innovation and you will get uh, what we call reasonable, scalable, but <coughs> local contextual proposals. That is, that is um, perhaps a difficult sentence, but what we mean by that is that sometimes you have a very small scale which will contribute to your bigger goal. Uh, and what you need to find is those pockets of um, uh, new ideas, sometimes very uh, small, sometimes on a bigger <coughs> scale, but um, uh, don't think that uh, from a, a public point of view you can form them. No, it will, through the competition, uh, they will form themselves. And they will all contribute in the end to the 80% because you will need different <coughs> initiatives. Um, and the second element, the second goal of this process is that it will lead to uh, proposals that will contribute and um, um, both public and private funding will, will be found for this uh, idea. So through the competition, uh, you can say, okay, we have a, um, um, uh, a great idea and we need this, this amount of money uh, to implement it. Uh, and it can be both a public and a private funding to make it really happen. And that's something completely different from a traditional point of view in which um, a public uh, entity <coughs> writes out the procurement and also pays for, uh, uh, for the project. And here you have the ability to really work uh, together. Um, now, there are of, so of course some boundary conditions that uh, need to be filled in if you want to start uh, this, uh, this process. And, and Jeff, perhaps you could uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. Um, there really needs to be, as Lenny said, there needs to be a, a support infrastructure in place um, in order for a recycle by design competition to really be effective um, and to accomplish its goals. Um, and we're not saying that that infrastructure necessarily exists at this point, but part of the entire recycle by design process is to create that infrastructure in order to make uh, in order to make this a successful project. And as Steve said, and as Marcella said, um, probably the, the key component of this infrastructure is to make sure that you've got an, an engaged community. Um, Community is number one in this. You need to get the people involved from day one in order to buy into the concepts, to have, not only buy in, but to be there while the concepts are being created so that they have a voice in it, they feel like they've participated in it. Ultimately, they can take ownership in it. Because if they take ownership in it, uh, I think whoever said it, looking through the lens, um, you know, they need, to, they need to keep that with them uh, in order to keep these practices in place you know, for, for uh, you know, carrying the program out. I'm just thinking, with Hurricane Sandy, the community was desperate for some kind of solutions. Yep. And th th there may have been a lot easier to, to create that, that, that environment right then at that moment in time. With recycling and waste stuff in this city, in, unless, you know, I mean, it's hard enough to convince people we're in big trouble with global warming. Yeah. But to, to, you know, to get people focused on waste issues, it, it, it prob again, it, it would probably be, uh, it would take some, some other kind of energy to create that engaged community and engaged community. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely a challenge, but I mean, that's why we're here talking to folks like you. Because it's, it's people like you, you know, that have got your arms out into the community that are engaging with them, not, maybe on other issues, maybe it's not recycling. Um, you know, but, but you've got the, the connections into the community. Um, what we need is to, to generate a level of enthusiasm, uh, to look at recycling and reuse um, as, as through a different lens. Um, so there is a very positive aspect. And that they see the end results as being positive and, and in some way bettering you know, their, you know, their personal situation. There's a wonderful tradition in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> it's very easy to mobilize people when you want to put a transfer station or a an incinerator in the neighborhood. Right. That's the only time we can... Nothing like NIMBY. Uh, no, it's the only time we can get that type of attention. And every time we do, we make progress. Right. Um, and we are making progress in this city. But um, in, in our situation, it's not a question of th this city does not need any design help. 
because there's nothing, they don't have to invent anything new. It's a question of replication of what's working in other cities, same size, same circumstances. And <clears throat> you're using the word, collectively, you're using the word community and industry without differentiating the subcategories. For instance, in this community, there are a lot of smart people around garbage, but they cannot get themselves heard because of the DC bureaucracy. And um, the DC bureaucracy, the DPW, is now spending about $300,000 on a study. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I, we can get to all the details, um, which they've been told time and time again is unnecessary and completely besides the point. Um, and we could fill you in on those <coughs> details. Yeah. So that's a level of frustration that we, we don't need. And, and the DPW tells us that they need outside information for help, but they go to these esoteric consulting firms to get this help. And these consulting firms are trying to teach them how to think about the problem, not trying to help them solve the problem. So it's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, and there are cities uh, in, in the country uh, that are providing working models. And in fact, uh, you heard earlier that we're working on this uh, uh, e-scrap uh, yep. recycling. Yep. Uh, everything we're learning and implementing here comes from successful companies, private and public, uh, around the country. Yeah. So it's not a question of design, in my opinion, it's not a question of design, it's a question of, of, of uh, like forcing uh, the, the city council, the, mayor, the new mayor, and the bureaucracy to, to listen to their citizens, <coughs> which they're not doing. Yeah, let's follow, my mayor, yeah of course. Sure, sure. Let's, let's follow on that point for a second and go back to what's happened in New York on the rebuild by design process. One of the big issues that occurred we had to deal with very quickly on the rebuild by design process was saying what is infrastructure and what's green infrastructure and what's gray infrastructure. When you say infrastructure and some similar principles apply to recycling, I'll get to that in a second. When you save the word infrastructure, people think of gray infrastructure, concrete, rebar, metal, things like that. And so when the initial discussions began, the community involved me began everything, oh boy, great, you're talking about building seawalls. And in fact, one of the companies that was there makes uh, seawalls that lay down flat before a flood and then the flood, they come back up. But the reason we had to talk to the community about this and, and, that, uh, and to get their input on their original ideas on, on the like was because we said, no, there's not just gray, gray infrastructure, there's green infrastructure. And green infrastructure doesn't mean building seawalls, we recycled materials. Green infrastructure means literally changing and using the landscape. It means planning and changing the way people move themselves, where they locate their houses, how they, can, how they construct them, how uh, indeed how the growth is steered in the community was considered, it, while not infrastructure, it is, that was part of the solution. And so when we explained those things, there was sort of this, aha, okay, so you're not talking about spending billions and billions of dollars to, to put up walls or, or to, uh, you know, raise subway stations or put in gigantic pumps and things like that. Well, that might have to be part of it, but what are, which said the biggest and most productive effort was going to come in a new way of thinking about this. <coughs> there was no precedent around the country for thinking about sea level rise and coastal protect community protection in that way. So even though there were solutions presumably could point to, those solutions actually didn't exist in the Netherlands. They didn't really exist anywhere else in the world because they had to be tailored to the specific needs of the community, the interests of the community, the landscape of the community, the way the community deals in, in, with, their, with their particular issues. Recognizing recycling is, is a more compact process. We're not trying to rec recreate the coastline here or anything. But I, ju I just wanted to say that, 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 that the lessons from other communities will take hold, I believe, will take hold to the extent that people can per internalize those. Well, I, I would get back to what, what um, Chris said. I don't see the analogy between the, the Sandy communities and our situation here in D.C. And I, I don't know what, what happened to Sandy money in New York. But in New Jersey, Sandy money, very little of it has been distributed. 
and, and large amounts of it have gone to ship uh, waste to an incinerator in Reading, Pennsylvania, which solves the problem, but not in, not in the way that sure. a lot of people around this table would like to see it solved. No. Sure. Um, and um, there is no shortage of money. In fact, uh, New Jersey has $800 million that they haven't spent yet, and it's mm. been two and a half years. The only money that has been spent has gone to communities that weren't hit by Sandy because of the political situation. That's, so that's a, I think that's a pretty accurate assessment yeah. of what, so, what, so, <laughs> what has it worked. So you have an emergency <laughs> there, you have money, and, and they're not doing it. We have a, a very solvable situation. There's plenty of money. Uh, DC is a very rich city, but there's this, uh, you know, there's this. Uh, uh, a, a it's a political challenge, not a technological one. Yeah. For us, as I see it. Yeah. Well, I th I think that um, uh, uh, there is, in the way you describe it, um, I'm a Dutchman, so I, I'm not sure that I use all the words correctly. So please help me with that. But there's a kind of deadlock. Uh, in, in the situation, and you want to create a breakthrough. Yes, absolutely. And you're searching for what what uh, is necessary to create that breakthrough. And what we uh, uh, what we would like to present to you is um, uh, another another way of working together than has been done uh, until now. So if I use my hands, there's now. Uh, some kind of uh, of uh, hats together, mm -hmm. uh, and what you really want to do is work together. And there you need um, a, a tailor-made approach. Uh, and it re and like we put on the on, on the slide, it requires something like a flexible mind. So we need to sit together, and uh, we will end the presentation with that. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing now is pre to present you an idea <coughs> of how to create. The breakthrough, uh, and of course we can do it only on a high level, and we need to sit together and make it make it tailor made for for your situation. Um, and you must have a very strong will to uh, adjust the process so that it will result to uh, what you want to achieve. Because otherwise we are spending your time and our time, and 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 you're not doing it. Well. I, first of all, I, I welcome this, and about a quarter of a mile from here is the Amsterdam falafel shop, and we can go talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're great admirers of the Dutch, believe yeah. me. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so uh, but, I, but basically, um, um, uh, what we are proposing is that um, uh, you, let, you bring in um, uh, the, 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 the best teams that work together with local communities and say to the guys who are now blocking uh, the way forward, listen up. We have been working together. We have these great ideas and they have the buy-in of the local communities, which you really need to increase your recycling rate to 80% because you need every citizen, every shop owner, every enterprise, otherwise you will not succeed a zero waste city. Um, we work together. And we have several ideas, some small scale, some bigger scale. But <clears throat> the challenge is that you add them up all together, and together they will result in uh, the 80% recycling. That's what, that's what this process is, re that, that, is all that, about. That approach is so critical here because uh, most of the uh, organics recovered, food waste recovered, had been going to Wilmington. Right. They yep. lost their permit. And so um, uh, my colleague, Brenda Platt, is focusing on building community uh, capacity for composting. One, to keep the stuff local, but yeah. also there's no place to take it now until that plant comes back online. Yeah. So we appreciate the, the need for small scale yeah. being cumulative to solve a big problem. We think that that's um, uh, absolutely critical uh, because 80%, uh, I'm ambitious, <laughs> yep. but 80% is, is, is um, uh, it, it's quite ambitious. Let me put it in. Uh, uh, my 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 good friends from the embassy are here, so I, I will address it in a diplomatic way. Uh, <laughs> I will. So so here are the the basic steps, and this is not a blueprint. But uh, let's let's move to the end of the presentation, then have a short uh, uh, discussion. We can uh, elaborate on this a little bit more. But for us, 
the, the, biggest, the biggest question, and we really hope that you could help us with that, is if, if we can agree that a breakthrough is necessary uh, in, in, this, in this situation, if we can agree on the fact that you need local, uh, scalable, uh, multi-ideas put together uh, that will add up to the, the 80 percent, if we can agree on the situation that uh, innovation can help public-private partnerships and, and new um, um, uh, partnerships can, can help, where do we start? So who is it that, that um, uh, which entity can um, uh, start this, uh, this process? Is it you? Uh, is it still uh, the public, uh, a public entity? Is it a private fund? Uh, we are really searching for where to start and then make it tailor-made together. So um, um, uh, that, that's what, uh, that's what we would try to uh, accomplish. And, and my last slide, I told you already in this presentation, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic and uh, also like ambition. So let's put on an ambition and put it on the table. If you really want to have a breakthrough and if you want to start uh, really work on increasing your recycling rates, let's try to launch early next year in the first quarter of, or in the second quarter of next year this competition, uh, that's fast, that's really fast. But okay, let's agree on, on that ambition. Where do we start? That's what, that's what uh, the question is. So this, this, this was the last slide. I believe our names are on it, but that's not, so very, not, not very interesting, so I put this one on. <laughs> this is the idea we have. Um, we do this uh, on different places um, uh, around the world. Um, every time it's tailor-made, every time it is uh, a puzzle, you need to put all the pieces together and then it will work. Uh, you need an open mind, you need to be flexible, but uh, the energy it creates is tremendous. Uh, and that's what we really like from uh, the RMC Rebel point of view. So, that's the end of the presentation. Now, now we need to discuss. <coughs> well, what, what I originally wanted...